So I want to talk this morning about working uh, effectively on open source projects, and specifically uh, in partnership with people in government. My name is Jason Denizak. I'm a Code for America fellow this year, and I'll talk about that in a second. But first, why would we want to partner in government? Governments have a lot of users. Governments have an obligation to serve everybody. And what this means is that it's a great opportunity to practice uh, skills around accessibility and user-centered design. Governments have access to a lot of really fun data. You could work on some pretty amazing projects. The operations of government directly affect our daily lives. And when we partner with government uh, as civic hackers, both we and governments can achieve far more than either of us could alone. So I have um, a background in public policy. I'm also a web developer. I have uh, a fair amount of uh, experience working on different projects in um, a nonprofit setting, in a public setting, in uh, community advocacy, uh, and activist setting. And like many of you, I spend an inordinate amount of time on the internet. Uh, I mentioned that this year I'm a Code for America fellow. Code for America is a nonprofit that helps uh, bring people and governments together through design and technology. We're uh, based in San Francisco. We do work all over the country. Um, but I want to emphasize that what I say in this talk is uh, talking for me and not for Code for America. Um, although, for the sake of full disclosure, we are uh, currently accepting applications for next year's fellowship class, and if that's something that any of y'all are interested in, I'm happy to talk with you more uh, after this. I'm going to be using a term in this talk uh, that may seem controversial, or you may or may not have heard of it before, uh, and that is civic hacking. And I want to be clear what I mean by this. I consider a hack to be any improvement on an existing system. Uh, it may not have been designed or envisioned this way originally, uh, but it's a change that makes life better for someone. I hold a fundamentally positive definition of hacking, both as a noun and as a verb. A hacker is someone who holds a worldview that systems are fundamentally hackable, that is amenable to change. Uh, hackers keep an eye out for things which could be made better. And a civic hacker, then, is someone who sees cities and communities as just another system to hack. So a civic hacker doesn't necessarily have to have any particular skill set. Uh, doesn't have to uh, really be anything that's that far out of the ordinary. Um, active and engaged citizens could be seen as civic hackers. The key to being a hacker, in my definition, is the attitude or the inclination to want to change things for the better and to participate in that. So you might already be a civic hacker if when you see a problem, your first thought is to work to fix it and try to make it better rather than just to complain about it. So James Madison was a really early systems architect. So this is kind of a treat this morning. It's actually two talks in one. The first I'm calling Hacking with Humility. After that, uh, I'm talking about what the hall. In Hacking with Humility, I consider a couple of things that uh, are mostly about communication and awareness and will apply to open source projects generally and community collaborative projects generally. Uh, and the second part is focused uh, on addressing the bureaucracy a little bit more head on. So why do we hack? We want to make things better. And there are a lot of things which could be made better. For me, uh, I, I think something that struck me really early on is this phrase that's kind of drilled into us, that life is not fair. Why do you expect things to be fair? Well, why isn't it fair? And so an underlying thread in all of my work is what can we do to maybe make it a little bit more so, a little bit more fair? Everyone comes to this with kind of their own uh, uh, direction or objectives or things that they want to accomplish, but that's mine. 
So why is it important that we hack with humility? Why do we pursue any of our work uh, with an eye towards uh, including others? Attendees of this conference and other conferences like it um, have an impressive array of skills and abilities. Uh, we can do things that it seems that people around us simply can't. But it's really easy to get stuck being impressed with ourselves um, in a way that's going to shut other people down and that other people won't necessarily see as impressive but might see as mean. All of, all of this logic, all of this uh, being impressed with our skill set is all in our heads. And if we want to do good, we have to learn to play well with others. I posit that we are all profoundly ignorant about at least some parts of our lives. And we would do really well to listen to other people. So how might we be humble? Well, I think that it starts with listening and appreciating others' work and being open to new ideas and suggestions. But it's really about inclusivity. If you've ever heard the phrase, routing around the damage, I think that it's a really toxic phrase. In some cases, it could be really helpful. In engineering situations, it might be good for designing redundant networks where you want to be able to uh, basically treat pieces as interchangeable and uh, say that it's OK if we have pieces that, that fail because we have redundant failovers. Um, this is not a great model for organizing communities that are made up of humans. This is secession. It's breaking away. And uh, it's a power play. It's an end run. And it might let you ship faster on whatever your project is. But you're going to come out of it with some people feeling really crummy at the end of the day. And we don't want that. Um, you're not going to get a lot of allies out of your work doing that. No one likes to be called damaged. <laughs> Why are you routing around damage? Um, here's a general kind of organizer-y aphorism. Uh, if you want to go fast, go alone. And if you want to go far, go together. In addition to inclusivity, good communication is also a way to show humility. Communicate your goals and your needs and your wants, and be open to new suggestions about how to actually get there. It's about removing ego uh, from your communication, but this isn't really a talk about logical fallacies or communications, anti-patterns or anything like that. Um, but has anyone read the book Crucial Conversations? Or there's another book that I like a little bit better um, called Nonviolent Communication that I was introduced to by Isaac Schletter uh, of NPM Inc. And he um, spoke about it last year at NodeConf EU. Um, and I'm just going to borrow his slide directly from his presentation um, with attribution. But this is basically the, the pattern that uh, nonviolent communication talks about. When I see observation, I feel emotion because I need thing. So could you please respond to this request? What's really important here is that it's not necessarily talking um, about the other party in the communication. You're not assigning blame or motive or accusing people of being uh, mean-spirited or, or whatever, um, what you're actually doing is, is providing disclosure about your own thought process and helping give insight to other people into what you're thinking and how you're uh, perceiving the world and how that affects you and what your thought process is. So in addition to communicating uh, your, own, your own thoughts and, and feelings and needs, um, it's important to engage in technical projects uh, with plain speech. By speaking in non-technical language, you could be much more inclusive to a broader uh, audience that includes people from a whole lot of different variety of uh, backgrounds and skill sets. People who can make real contributions to your project that might otherwise be shut down through endless amounts of jargon uh, or, or acronyms or other things that um, could be really unapproachable. In addition to making a conscious effort to avoiding introducing your own technical jargon, uh, being willing 
to uh, explain technical jargon that uh, is, is coming from other sources um, is really important. It can uh, be worth it to kind of take the time and slow down and make sure that everyone is understanding the language that's being used in your project without getting annoyed or, gosh, why don't you, why don't, can you go like RTFM or something over there? Um, it's, it's much better when everyone is able to speak and communicate about uh, what the project actually is. And um, another part of that is not just giving like dictionary technical def definitions, but actually being able to adapt that to what is this other thing, what is it in, in plain language, and how is that relevant to the project that we have? Why do we need to, to be dealing with that at all? In a lot of contexts, particularly governmental uh, bureaucracies, but uh, also in, in a lot of other sorts of um, uh, kind of deep domain projects, you'll come into it with a lot of existing language. And as, uh, uh, as a hacker, as a, a programmer, your first thought might be to get in there and refactor that and say, well, all this language that you're using is actually wrong and, and we should use this other thing that's so much more simple and elegant. Um, and even though that seems like you're kind of being biased towards plain language, what you're actually doing uh, is, is being pedantic and uh, um, just kind of pressing the issue and making a power play of forcing existing uh, players to kind of uh, speak your language and use your words. Um, so it's usually best to avoid that. Sometimes it matters, user judgment. Um, sometimes it can offer a real clarification and move the group forward, uh, but often it's just derailing. So I want to conclude this portion by talking a little bit about uh, negotiation because it's really something that can change um, the course of the project and affect the scope of how much you're able to accomplish, especially when you are working with multiple uh, outside partners. Negotiation is not about arguing and it's not about just getting your way or getting to yes, just getting an agreement as quickly as possible. Negotiation is a way of exploring uh, a space of opportunities and trying to find shared value while you're reaching a consensus with other people. Negotiation, like many other things, benefits from preparation. Uh, it's a skill where we're planning it out and talking through it ahead of time, especially if it's not something that you consider one of your main things, can be really helpful. Uh, so finding a mentor or someone else to kind of talk through and, and plan an upcoming negotiation um, can be really useful. And before going into a negotiation, one of the things that you want to know is what is it that you actually want? What's your desired outcome? And if the negotiation fails and you have to walk away, what's the cost of that? Why, why are you actually negotiating in the first place? And the degree to which you could also understand that about the other party uh, is going to be beneficial for everyone involved, as we'll see uh, in a moment. And then this is open source bridge. So I would say that being open in negotiation uh, is the best policy. Um, negotiation is not about tricks. Uh, it's not about selling used cars. But it's about communicating uh, everything really honestly and openly and trying to get the best possible outcome for both parties. Um, and this is where understanding the other party's objectives and taking the time to actually kind of talk through them, uh, uh, talk through things with them, um, can really improve the value of a round of negotiations. Raising possible uh, objections or deal breakers in your conversation, in your negotiations, uh, proactively and in good faith, uh, can really help reach a mutually uh, beneficial solution. So here's a, a visual model. Um, we have two axes. The vertical axis is the other party's desired outcome. Uh, up is better. The horizontal axis is your desired outcome. So you can imagine it as a, a big 2D planar space. And there's some sort of curve in this space uh, along which a negotiated outcome might occur. Or you might walk away and, and just not have any sort of outcome, which would probably, depending on, on uh, what you come up with going into it, be something that's 
kind of lower, not necessarily a great outcome for either party. We're hoping, right, the, the hypothesis going in is that by engaging in this negotiation, you're both going to have a, a better outcome uh, than before. So anywhere in the middle could be a possible uh, agreement that you might reach from the negotiations. So this X, let's say this is the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, we propose, OK, why don't um, you let us work on this project, and in exchange, um, all of your users will get this thing, and we get to like, put your name on it and have access to, to your users or your constituents or whatever. Um, we go in. It's kind of straightforward. We tell them what we want. They come back, and they say, yeah, sure, OK. So we're done. We got to yes. We have an agreement. And this is a fantastic outcome. Right? Well, so let's see. We got a little bit more than halfway through uh, our desired outcome. It's kind of on the positive side, a little bit less than halfway uh, to, to their kind of hypothetical desired outcome. Still not terribly bad, but um, you know. This area under here is the value that we were able to reach from this negotiation. But all of this area outside of it, <coughs> underneath this hypothetical curve, is waste. Uh, we left a lot on the table, including stuff that could be more valuable to both parties in the negotiation. So how could we structure our communications within the negotiation to make it more likely to capture more of that value and minimize waste? Again, we're starting with the idea that we both want better outcomes. And then, of course, we don't always have uh, our best uh, bearings in terms of where we are in the negotiation with any particular agreement. We don't have a GPS for negotiations. Uh, we start pretty much in the dark. But we can begin to clarify that, starting with our own desired outcomes. This is where, through disclosure, uh, we could have kind of self-knowledge about what we want and where we're coming from and help uh, share that with the other party in the negotiations. From here, we can make tentative proposals and ask questions to learn more about the other party in the negotiation and try to clarify their axis. The key here, again, is transparency uh, and being confident in your requests and honest in how you frame the negotiation. So as we clarify this landscape, this negotiation space, we could be more straightforward about the trade-offs. We could build trust, and we could help everyone be happier with the outcomes and potentially more willing to compromise or make a consensus. So this bit about negotiation is based on the assumption that your interactions with people are going to be a repeat game that is relationship-based rather than transactional. And I think that this is a good assumption, especially when you're dealing with a fixed geographic area, for example, a government. So negotiating fairly and communicating openly and honestly builds trust, which makes it easier to work over time to be able to tackle larger and more ambitious goals and projects. But shared work experience also builds trust. So all of this is a lot of work, though. To think critically for a second, is all of this just early optimization? Why not just go in, we have some idea in our minds of what might work, let's just, you know, pack it out and throw it against the wall and, and see what sticks. Um, this is all just kind of like water folly and big design up front. And, and why, why are we investing in this? Um, this is really expensive and not necessarily the way I write software. But it turns out the open source projects and, and collaborative projects with, with outside uh, people that are done maybe on a coalition basis are really amenable to continuous delivery as a strategy, as a way of building trust. By breaking deliverables uh, into smaller chunks and being able to ship code on a consistent basis or ship your project, whatever it may be, what you're doing is you're providing some sort of feedback loop into the process, especially for non-technical collaborators who might see what you do and what you bring to the table as really abstract, and they might feel really out of control of all of that. So by being able to shorten the process time, the, the cycle time, between a discussion that you might have and an actual change to running code, you're able to give them more control and more participation in the project. 
So this doesn't have to be water folly. It could actually be um, however you want to write software. This can turn a single project engagement into a more relationship-based interaction and lead to better outcomes. This is all in the name of reducing uncertainty for the other uh, parties in the project and for helping people feel like they're actually um, a valuable part of the collaboration, uh, even if they're not directly contributing in a technical capacity. Uh, and then lastly, share credit. I mean, everyone wants to look good. If you go back to why we're actually hacking in the first place or why we're working on this project, is it to build a name for ourselves or because we care about the outcome um, of the project itself? Uh, so actively finding opportunities to invite uh, and acknowledge contribution from other stakeholders can be a really good way for everyone to uh, contribute successfully to the project, but also feel really good about it. And in closing for this section, I think that that's part of what humility really is, is being uh, really mindful about how you engage with other people in your projects. So part two, what the hall? Bureaucracy is hard to spell, but it's not a bad word. In part one, we talked about being humble in service to the project team. And that can really be applied to all sorts of open source projects. But what is special about governments? I think that there are a couple of things uh, that can change your interactions and that are just good to be aware about going in to governments. When you think about environments that are really well suited uh, and, and where you find hacking and creativity, it might look more like the hacker lounge downstairs than what you envision a city hall or a, a government uh, office. But government employees are people too. And despite stereotypes, in my opinion, really terrible stereotypes, of lazy or corrupt officials, uh, people in government are fundamentally smart, they're well-meaning, and they're dedicated public servants who operate within a very specific structure that influences their behavior. So let's explore some of the organizational psychology, incentive structures, and management approaches in government that can help explain behavior that you otherwise might just find really frustrating. The first is the money. Follow the variable. The most important piece of policy in any government is the budget. Budgets are set on a regular time frame. Uh, typically annually, although in some cities it might be biannually or on some other interval. Uh, but understanding this is key to kind of understanding the rhythm and flow that the entire rest of the governmental bureaucracy is running on. This is the clock that matters. Additionally to understanding some of the, the timing aspects of it, uh, sitting down and actually reading the budget can be really revealing about the actual priorities of whatever government you're working with. It controls what projects are started, expanded, or killed. Uh, department heads especially are preoccupied in the months leading up to uh, setting the budget. This is uh, uh, really important if the project that you're working on is going to need funding uh, or money or other significant resources. Um, you're going to have to be involved early on in this process. Um, but if your project is smaller in scope and you just need some time from government officials, maybe their approval, um, it might be much harder to get a hold of people during this time. So understanding kind of the, the overall schedule of uh, the government that you're working with is really, uh, can be a big factor in your success. Elections are another one of these uh, things that happen on a regular basis and that have a huge influence on uh, the, the motivations and priorities of people in government. Uh, especially changes in administration. So that means either the, the mayor or the city manager, depending on the environment that you're in, or whatever the other executive uh, is if you're working at a different level in government. Um, even if it's a, a non-political project in your mind, uh, it's going to uh, factor in at some level to an overall set of priorities or agenda that the government is working on. And if what you're uh, doing doesn't have some way of fitting into there, it's going to be a lot harder to get time from people and attention from people. 
during a heated election um, or in an unpopular administration at pretty much any time, uh, people are going to be a lot less willing to take risks. Uh, just as a strategy, it, it's just kind of keeping your head down and not uh, rocking the boat any more than you have to. Um, what this means is that people might be uh, less likely to take on new projects or outside collaborators, especially if they don't have a history of working with you uh, or seeing any of your other track record. Towards uh, the end of an administration, people will also be less willing to take on new, uh, new projects, no matter how safe they are, even if they're not particularly risky. Um, it's just kind of that, that feeling um, where you've done all your final exams and you're just kind of waiting for the grades to come back and you're not really doing a whole lot at that point. And you're kind of, kind of coasting through. But as a, a counter to all this, at the beginning of an administration, um, people are like actively looking for new ideas. There's maybe a really high level direction that's been set or campaign promises or something that's been made and people want to get quick wins. So they're going to go out of their way to be willing to work with you if they see you as a potential ally and if they see your project as fitting in to their goals and their, their stated uh, desired outcomes. You can be much more likely to gain traction. And really regardless of the timing within uh, the election cycle, matching the projects that you want to pursue with other people's priorities makes it more likely that they'll pay attention and return your calls and emails. This one uh, can be really tricky. Who, who are you working with and how did they get to be where they are? Within government, there's kind of two basic uh, uh, types of employees. You could either be an appointee, uh, sometimes called a political appointee, or a classified employee. Appointees are typically heads of departments, uh, then leadership positions, and they, are, uh, they serve at the pleasure, ultimately, of some elected official who is able to put them there. On the other side, in classified employees, these are uh, positions with a more generic but really well-defined job description. As you can imagine, these, these differences uh, affect their motivations. Uh, appointees generally have much more leeway in terms of the work that they pursue. Their tenure often matches that of the elected official who appointed them. So department heads often will be around uh, only as far as the end of the next term. One kind of notable exception in many cases is around uh, public safety. So police or fire chiefs, um, even though they, they do serve at the pleasure of elected officials, uh, tend to stick around longer uh, and also tend to be seen as less partisan uh, positions. Classified employees also tend to stick around longer. These are the frontline employees who make an agency work on a day-to-day -day basis. They're involved in the operations. They work in well-defined positions. Uh, and are most often career track. They may have seen many different administrations come and go in many different policy directions. They may be less likely to get on board quickly. They're not necessarily early adopters, um, especially if they think that your project will be a distraction or, or make their job harder. They're acutely aware of how limited the resources are that they're given to work with, and their interest is in performing whatever uh, duty they, they feel like their agency is performing for the public, uh, but they're maybe less interested in how that's done. So if you show them this new system and, and promise them all these benefits, they're not necessarily going to uh, see that immediately. They also may think that you're simply a flash in the pan and that they could just outlast you, like they've lasted, uh, outlasted a lot of other new policy initiatives. But classified employees can also offer staying power. If you can involve them and make them happy, you can tap into the actual operations of a government agency and potentially have a much bigger and far-reaching and long-lasting change from your project. Any project that wants to make the frontline citizen experience better and change the way that we as citizens interact with government is going to have to involve classified employees and frontline agency employees. Classified, uh, it's also important to note, refers to the job descriptions themselves. These are very rigidly defined uh, and, and kind of one of the hallmarks of bureaucracy. Um, they may restrict the ability of employees to take on new tasks. It's not in my job description, 
might seem really frustrating uh, to, to us, but it's actually a protection for employees to keep them from being assigned uh, too much additional work without being compensated for it. Employee pay in bureaucracies is determined by a formula uh, to prevent uh, abuse and corruption uh, and illegal political discrimination. So it's a, it's a trade-off. It creates a more stagnant atmosphere, uh, a more stagnant workplace environment to be able to um, uh, be a little bit more resistant to kind of um, other types of abuse. So budgets are where the money is. Well, budgets are, are where uh, someone says the money is and, and kind of a general directive of how it should be spent. Um, they're, they're the spreadsheets. Procurement and purchasing is the checkbook. That's how the money is actually spent and that's how goods and services in government are actually uh, um, purchased or procured. The, the processes and procedures around procurement are actually one of the things that leads to a lot of um, what we, we may see as frustrating technology systems or, or failed technology projects in government. Because the rules by which you define a project and, and go through that whole process um, are not necessarily what we would consider as best practices in software development or technology development. Um, but again, these rules are in place for reasons of preventing graft and fraud and abuse of public funds. Um, and so purchasing is controlled through a series of well-defined procedures and rules. It also is one of the many reasons that government employees typically don't have experience uh, in interacting with open source project teams. Vendor contracts are often structured in ways that end up creating a very siloed development environment and don't necessarily encourage a lot of collaboration between people uh, in the at the agency level and um, the developers or people who are actually contributing um, on the front lines of developing the project. Some other questions that might come up when working uh, on government uh, collaborations is how is it going to run? Who's going to maintain it after you leave? These are things that are very uh, um, important questions to address early on to build confidence uh, and get people uh, giving you the time of day. If people think that a project is set up for failure from the beginning, they're not going to want to <laughs> join in uh, with it, especially if it's not part of their um, written job description. So these are things that don't necessarily have to be very complicated, especially uh, with uh, kind of the, the way that um, a lot of software is built these days with high levels of automation and, and great tools around all of this. Uh, but it's something that is really in the best interest of the project to address it head on and up front. Um, figure out um, who's going to maintain it, what servers is it going to be on, is the city's IT department or, or the agency's IT department going to have a role in any of this? Who will be responsible for security and privacy uh, implications of the project as it runs? In government, context is really key. This applies both uh, on the policy side of your project and on the legal side of your project. There's a whole lot of considerations that you might have, but basically putting more thought up front into your project is going to be really helpful. Making a commitment to working on an open source project in government is a little bit different than just picking up a weekend hack project. Uh, there's a lot of theory involved, and in government you're playing with live ammunition, so to speak. You're working on, on policies and systems that are actually going to affect people's lives, and so it's really important to understand uh, the, the context, the community, uh, and who the people are who are going to be impacted and directed, uh, affected by your work. That means reading a newspaper, understanding a little bit about the policy area that uh, your project is working in, and seeing who else has done work in the area. We're coming to this as, as hackers, as technologists, because we have an earnest desire to help, we have a fairly unique skill set, but we're not always, in fact, we're usually not domain experts in whatever policy area we're trying to fix. Part of being humble in coming into projects is recognizing the expertise and the long and hard work that a lot of other people have put in before us. 
So being generally knowledgeable about at least some of that and willing to engage and ask questions with other people can show that you have a, a real desire in the outcome of the project rather than in just making yourself look good. The last part of the context is understanding the legal environment that you're working in. Uh, you don't necessarily have to be a lawyer, but the laws and the rules and regulations are basically the operating system that your project is going to be running on. So at least being somewhat familiar and being willing to ask questions uh, can go a long way both in terms of understanding some of your operating parameters and also demonstrating your level of, of seriousness and commitment to other people who are going to be uh, working with you on the project. People in government, uh, like we all do, but people in government especially have a, a duty and an obligation to follow the law, even if it might seem inconvenient or if it uh, uh, adds a lot of hassle maybe to the scope of your project. And I think that's a trade-off uh, that comes by, by wanting to work in an area that's going to have a higher impact and be more generally useful to everyone is to actually take that stuff seriously rather than just kind of clicking through the agreement as it were. So that's, that's what I have and I hope it's been useful and I'm happy to talk about any of this. The slides are online uh, and um, that's everything. Uh, I want to plug Code for Portland because they do really amazing work in this type of area here uh, in Portland. Um, so thank you. I'm not sure how we're doing on time, but I can take questions or five minutes for questions. The question is, what's my experience in the, the willingness of uh, people in government in terms of wanting help from outside? Um, I think it's, it's going to vary. So um, I'm, as a Code for America fellow this year, I'm doing work in Chattanooga, Tennessee with their city government. And what we have found there, so kind of going, going off of some of this framework, it's uh, a, a new administration. The mayor was just elected uh, last spring. and. Um, there was a pretty much total changeover in uh, top-level uh, department administration. So a lot of new, new blood coming into the, the organization. Um, people have been very eager for change, but not always sure of how to uh, accomplish it or where to start. So um, we helped them with an open data policy um, and basically just being able to help with um, uh, kind of technical capacity there, being able to do a little bit of the, the legwork, um, looking up examples of policies from other places uh, like Portland, like San Francisco, Chicago, Philadelphia, um, being able to kind of do really some research at that level. Um, yeah. Ev everyone that we've, we've worked with has been um, at least not actively hostile. Um, and the hardest part is really finding time um, especially, like, it might be something that uh, you are focused on um, full time or giving it a lot more attention than your partners are because they're busy and they have to run a city. So. Uh, good, good, having a good kind of project management system in place uh, has been really helpful for us. So we use um, a whole lot of web-based tools that are different from ways that um, uh, our partners have been used to running projects. So we have a bug tracker for our projects, for example. Bringing in some of these kind of best practices from uh, doing open source projects, I think that's been, um, I, I've gotten some feedback that that's been the most valuable part um, for some of our partners is just seeing how we work rather than the specifics of what the work is. So. Yes. Uh, they, they, the, the, the question is, are, are um, people in government more sensitive to whether you're from the community uh, or are they more interested in just solving the problem? It depends. Um, probably, especially more um, uh, political people and, and if you're trying to kind of make a case or, or like asking city council for money for your project or something, um, they, they may be more sensitive to that. Um, 
governments, the, the traditional way that governments do technology projects or anything that's not part of their, their wheelhouse is to hire really expensive outside um, uh, consultants who are almost never from the area anyway. So it's certainly not unprecedented that someone from the outside is coming in and telling us how to do things. First of all, <laughs> it's not about telling people how to do things. Um, but I think just being, um, being reasonable and, and open and um, kind of transparent about your motivations for wanting to work in a, in a certain community, if it's not your own, um, and, and having an attitude of being in service to that community rather than kind of pushing your own agenda is, is, um, can go a long way towards making people more comfortable with your involvement. Where, where to start with in government? Um, should you start with uh, political uh, people or, or elected officials um, or at the classified employee level? Um, it's an interesting question. You're, you're going to need some level of executive sponsorship. You're going to need some kind of like leadership level position to kind of sign off on, on it being OK for whoever you actually end up working with on the, on the day to day. Um, to be able to be in your project. Um, it probably, this is where working with other kind of uh, groups that maybe have more experience of, of uh, working in collaboration with government can be really helpful. If there's a particular area that your project is around, um, they might know kind of, or have pre-established relationships with people from some of these agencies, right? It might be the Health and Human Services Department or the Parks Department. Um, if you're just sending out kind of cold emails or, or like trying to pitch a project, basically, um, probably a, a department head level. And um, oftentimes, they not, might not be reading their emails. And so it'll get routed to the, the correct person from there. But just kind of um, acknowledging their, their leadership and their position, I think, is probably a good way to go. Um, because they're the ones whose neck is kind of on the line, and they're kind of like the single ringable neck in this whole process. And they're also the people who are going to want to uh, look good from your project at the end of the day. So at least having their, their kind of initial involvement and awareness is really important. Now, um, at, since there's a lot more thought and kind of upfront work that goes into some of these projects, um, it certainly makes sense to kind of interact with, with the, kind of some of the day-to-day -day people uh, maybe while brainstorming or coming up with new projects, and this could be on a much more informal basis, right? You might um, like just talk to some some park employees at a park, for example, or or anything else like that, or just like in an informal social situation. Yes. So, so resources for helping, um, uh, I guess, risk-oriented uh, people at the classified employee level to um, understand some of uh, the concepts around open source software. I think rather than specific resources, there's a lot out there. But just being um, aware and, and uh, deliberately trying to understand um, kind of what education might uh, be a part of your project. Um, is is a good place to start with that. Um, if you have kind of more concrete things, um, I mean, having having a community of other people to be able to like share and refer those resources and build uh, kind of a, a civic hacking community. Um, uh, Code for America has um, a national network called uh, the Brigades, which is kind of volunteer-run organizations in a lot of different cities across the country. Code for Portland is an example of one of them. Um, and so between that network, there's a lot of, of kind of more concrete resources if there's a specific thing. Um, but so, so that's another thing is that almost across the board, 
uh, municipal governments have zero dollar training budgets. And the training that they do have is gonna be focused on uh, minimizing risk, right? And so very important things, right? It might be like a sexual harassment training or, or something like that. Um, but it's not necessarily around technical training and it's not necessarily around um, very specific topics like open source software or um, writing uh, good content for the web or something like that. So if as part of the collaboration in your project, you could uh, maybe identify and, and maybe help facilitate some of that training, um, I think that a lot of people in government are going to be um, really looking for things like that because there aren't a lot of opportunities necessary, necessarily for uh, skill development um, and career development, um, typically. Cool. Yes, one more, and then I think. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for being here as a as a classified government employee. No, I work with Okay. Thank you all.